Hi everyone, Jolene here from Bookworm Adventure Girl. I hope that you are all doing well. It's a long weekend and it's Monday, which means we are talking about Margaret Atwood. Today we will be talking about Atwood's 10th poetry collection called Interlunar. And as always on the first Monday of the month, I will add to our reading schedule and um, let you know at the end of the video what we will be reading in July. For now, let's talk about Interlunar. Interlunar was originally published in 1984. Atwood did the cover art on this one. And I think that I've mentioned this before, but I love that because this is a first edition, uh, when you look at Atwood's other books that are listed here at the front of the book in the beginning, we have read all of these. And I find that very exciting. Um, I was a little surprised to see snake poems in this collection. I thought we would be talking about snake poems when we got to Selected Poems 2. Uh, but since it's here, we will talk about it here. The collection begins with snake poems, which is 11 poems, and then there's interlunar, which is divided into three different sections. And when I first knew that Atwood had a group of poems that she called snake poems, um, this was before I had started this series and I was just, you know, thinking about it and I was, I thought that maybe she's using the snake as a symbol or as a metaphor for a message that she's trying to get across. Um, uh, but then I started the series and now I'm not surprised that, you know, even if you do argue the point that snakes in her snake poems are used as a symbol or something else, you also have to know and understand that she's really also just actually talking about snakes. So her poem White Snake is not about or for the band. Um, it's actually educational. So these poems reminded me of her friend Charles Patchter, which we talk about a few have talked about a few times, and how they first met when she asked him to come and touch the frogs so that the young people wouldn't be scared of them. Um, her curiosity and love of nature always comes through and this collection is no exception of that. So several of these poems have an animals in that country vibe to them. They include humor. Um, you don't have to get very far into the poem Eating Snake to see that. And as always, I love her writing and how she uses metaphors, which uh, make me think about things just in ways that I've never thought of them before. I love some of the metaphors used in the poem Lesson on Snakes, um, and I'm going to read a bit of it for you. It's on page nine. Pinned down, this one opens its mouth as wide as it can, showing fangs and a throat like the view down a pink lily, double tongue curved out like stamens. The lilies do it to keep from being eaten, this dance of snakes, and the snakes do it to keep from being eaten also, since they cannot talk. The snake is a mute, except for the sound like steam escaping from a radiator. It makes, when cornered, something punctured and leaking. The same is in the poem Bad Mouth, which is on page 11, um, when the poem talks about constrictors, and I, and I love this. And you, constrictor, constrictor, sinuous ribbon of true darkness, one long muscle with eyes and an anus, looping like thick tar out of the trees, to squeeze the voice from anything edible, reducing it to scales and belly. Several of the snake poems are also reminders of our place and connection to nature. They are subtle digs, but Atwood gets them in there. Um, in the first section of Interlunar, there are 15 poems. There are strong themes of power. It comes up many in many of the poems. And there is the theme of death and mystery. Um, mist is often used in the poems. There is the idea of invisibility, uh, what we see and don't see. And there is the changing of seasons, healing, spirituality, and there's the concept of duality, which we've seen a number of times before in Atwood's uh, writing. And Georgia Beach is a good example of this on page 50. It says, Georgia Beach. In winter, the beach is empty, but south, so there is no snow. Empty can mean either peaceful or desolate. Two kinds of people walk here, those who think they have love, 
and those who think they are without it. I am neither one nor the other. I pick up the vacant shells for which open means killed, saving only the most perfect, not knowing who they are for. Near the water there are skinless trees, fluid, grayed by weather, in shapes of agony, or you could say grace or passion as easily, in any case, twisted. By the wind which keeps going, the empty space, which is not empty space, moves through me. I come back past the salt marsh, dull yellow and rust colored, which whispers to itself, which is sad only to us. The second section has 14 poems, and this section has a cosmic vibe to it. There are themes of time and light. There is a lot of use of words that we can't see. Um, for example, in Orpheus 1, it talks about an echo. Um, there is a lot of Greek mythology, and the poems in this section are really dark. They talk about death, um, murder. There are several examples of those, uh, like Heart in the poem Harvest, and in the poem uh, Message Before I Heard About It. I think I'm going to share No Name, which is on page 74, because it has themes of vanishing, duality, the seasons, and it mentions the moon, and it's rather dark as well. This is the nightmare you now have frequently, that a man will come to your house at evening with a hole in him. You place it in the chest on the left side, with blood leaking out onto the wooden door as he leans against it. He is a man in the act of vanishing, one way or another. He wants you to let him in. He's like the soul of a dead lover, come back to the surface of the earth, because he did not have enough of it and is still hungry. But he is far from dead. Though the air lifts on your arms and cold air flows over your threshold from him, you have never seen anyone so alive. As he touches, just touches your hand with his left hand, the clean one, and whispers, please, in any language. You are not a doctor or anything like it. You have led a plain life, which anyone looking would call blameless. On the table behind you, there are bread on a plate, fruit in a bowl. There is one knife, there is one chair. It is spring and the night wind is moist with the smell of turned loam and the early flowers. The moon pours out its beauty, which you see as beauty finally, warm and offering everything. You have only to take. In the distance, you hear dogs barking. Your door is either half open or half closed. It stays that way and you cannot wake. The third section and final section has 13 poems and right away this section already has a lighter, more hopeful vibe. Poems in this section talk about the force of gravity, colors such as silver and light blues are used and the idea of coming out of shadow. So in the words continue their journey on page 83, the poem um, acknowledges that there is darkness, but near the end of the poem, it says this. In the place we're stuck in, the place we've chosen, a pilgrimage that took a wrong turn somewhere far back and ended here in the full glare of the sun and the hard red black shadows cast by each stone, each dead tree lurid in its particulars, its doubled gravity, but floating too in the aureole of stone, of tree. And we're no more doomed really than anyone as we go together through this moon terrain where everything is dry and perishing and so vivid into the dunes, vanishing out of sight, vanishing out of the sight of each other, vanishing even out of our own sight, looking for water. In the sidewalk on page 88, the last line is, everything's brighter just before, and it's just before always. Uh, same with the white cup on page 89, the last verse is, this is the one thing I wanted to give you, this quiet shining, which is a constant entering, a going into. And we are no longer in the theme of darkness. The poem titled The Skeleton, not as an image of death, makes that very clear. Um, this poem ends on page 91 with these words. Even in the dub subarctic of space beyond meaning, even among the never alive, to approach is to shine. I hold you as I hold water swimming. The next poem after that on page 92 is also appropriately titled The Light. And this section and the entire collection ends with the title poem, 
which I would like to share with you. So this is interlunar, which is on page 102. Darkness waits apart from any occasion for it. Like sorrow, it is always available. This is only one kind, the kind in which there are stars above the leaves, brilliant as steel nails and countless without regard. We are walking together on dead, wet leaves in the intermoon among the looming nocturnal rocks, which would be pinkish gray in daylight, gnawed and softened by moss and ferns, which would be green in the musty, fresh yeast smell of trees rotting, earth returning itself to itself. And I take your hand, which is the shape a hand would be if you existed truly. I wish to show you the darkness you are so afraid of. Trust me, this darkness is a place you can enter and be as safe in as you are anywhere. You can put one foot in front of the other and believe the sides of your eyes. Memorize it. You will know it again in your own time. When the appearances of things have left you, you will still have this darkness. Something of your own you can carry with you. We have come to the edge. The lake gives off its hush. In the outer night, there is a barred owl calling, like a moth against the ear, from the far shore, which is invisible. The lake, vast and dimensionless, doubles everything. The stars, the boulders, itself, even the darkness that you can walk so long in, it becomes light. This collection of poems is crafted quite well, and I looked up the word interlunar to make sure I had the correct understanding. And Webster told me that interlunar is relating to the interval between old and new moon when the moon is invisible. And I think that's exactly what Atwood has done in her own brilliant way. I do feel that snake poems was just kind of plopped in there. Um, there's some great snake poems, but it's kind of out of place uh, with the interlunar poems, in my opinion. So if we just consider the interlunar poems, then in the first section, you know, we are aware of time passing, the seasons, um, their seasons are changing, things are fading, or they're becoming invisible. Then in the second section, which is dark, about things that we fear, and some of it was even a bit uncomfortable to read, um, and it made me wonder, like, where is the moon when we can't see it, when it is invisible to us? Um, and then the third section brings new light and new hope. So I think that Atwood is trying to give the reader an interlunar experience as they read. Um, what about you? What are your thoughts about interlunar? I'm always happy to hear what, what you have to say. Um, I am also going to share with you the four books that we will be reading in July. Right now, our schedule only goes until the end of June. So first up, on July 5th, we will be starting the Mad Adam trilogy with Oryx and Crake. This novel was originally published in 2003. Next, on July 12th, is a non-fiction, originally published in 2004, Moving Targets, Writing with Intent. It's a huge one. Um, then on July 19th, we have this Itsy Bitsy Short Fiction <laughs> Bottle, which was originally published in 2004. Very, very tiny. And to finish the month off, on July 26th, we will have another novel, The Penelopeid, which was originally published in 2005. As always, I will leave the reading schedule for this series in the description box below. It will now include everything that we have read and everything up until the end of July. So please let me know if you have any favorite poems from Interlunar, or maybe like me, there were some of the poems that you found really dark. Um, I look forward to chatting with you in the comments. Thanks again for watching. I hope you enjoy your day, and don't forget to make every day an adventure.